this week. Matthew chapter 15, let's look in verse number 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. And he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You understand this woman's not of Israel. She's not a Jew. She's a Gentile. Verse number 25, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. In verse 28 he says, O woman, great is thy faith. I want faith like that. I want faith like that. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, would you help us this morning? There is an oppressive spirit in here. The choir was singing uphill. And Lord, folks are tired and folks are grieved and it feels oppressive. Lord, I have wrestled hard this, this week on what to say today. Lord, I believe with all my heart you have a word for somebody that someone desperately needs to hear. And our enemy, our adversary, desperately does not want them to hear it. And there is an oppressive spirit here this morning. God, I pray that you please set us free from it. You said where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Lord, the obvious uh, opposite truth of that is where an unclean spirit is, there is no liberty. So God, I pray right now that the power of the Holy Ghost would reign supreme in this room, in this sanctuary right now, even in this moment, and, and bind any unclean spirit, God, and give us spirit of liberty. Lord, please help us. Your children need your word. And I know Satan does not want them to get it. And God, I pray you give us liberty this morning. Help us. A lot of decisions have been made by some of these people this week. Lord, a lot, of, uh, a lot of hurdles were, were climbed over. A lot of bridges were burnt and a lot of decisions were made for your glory. And, and God, I know the devil wants to undo all of that and he wants to try to tear all that down. God, I pray you help us this morning, please. Lord, I want to encourage somebody's faith. Please use this text to be a blessing to somebody. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. O woman, great is thy faith. I want faith like that. I want faith that God would look at and say, that's great faith. That is not just decent faith. That's not just good faith. That's great faith. How many of you have seen that little commercial of the the, the business people over in... uh, over in uh, Switzerland or some wherever they speak Dutch, where they speak Dutch at, I don't know. And uh, and they're trying to do a business deal, and and the interpreter's sitting there in between them, and the guy says, "We really need this deal to go through." And he says, "He said it's it's all right. My Dutch is is okay." And they said, "Just okay." And he goes and he says something in Dutch, and and he. <laughs> He tells the guy that the guy needs a hug. And so the guy gets up and goes and, and gives the man a hug. And they're all confused. And, and it, because he wasn't good, he, he wasn't great, he was just good. And I don't want my faith to just be merely okay. I don't want my faith to just be merely good. I want great faith. I want the kind of faith that God would look and say, that is great faith. Now, stories of faith, stories of great faith often inspire us to have more faith. Is that right? 
a passage of scripture like this where this woman has great faith is, is very inspiring and it moves us. And, and I like what Jesus says in verse number 28, O oh, woman, great is thy faith. You see, faith overcomes all boundaries. In the Bible, there's, there, there are instances of great faith by both men and women by both young and old, by Jews and Gentiles. Faith overcomes all boundaries. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman or a child. It doesn't matter if you're red, yellow, black, or white. It doesn't matter if you're green with polka dots. We can have great faith in the Lord. And I want to look at these, uh, a few of these things in this passage of Scripture, and I hope to be a blessing to you. I want you to see, number one, this morning, faith can be measured. Faith can be Measured, He said in verse number 28, O woman, great is thy faith. He said it was great. He looked at it and said it's, it's big. It's large. It is, it is bigger than other things. He measured it. But in chapter 14, if you'll look across the page, Simon Peter has stepped out of the ship to walk on the water to come to Jesus, but now he's begun to sink. And in verse number 31, he, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of what kind of faith? Little faith. Wherefore didst thou doubt? And so Jesus tells this mother, your faith is great, but he tells Simon Peter that his faith is little. Now, turn to Matthew chapter 8, just back a few pages. Another contrast in faith. Matthew chapter 8 and in verse 5 says, When Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, means to beg, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. He says, this man has great faith. But now look later on in the chapter, there in verse number 23. The disciples have gotten into a ship with Jesus Christ and they're trying to get to the other side. But a great storm comes up there in verse number 24. And the Bible says that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. He saith unto them, Why are ye so fearful, O ye of what kind of faith? Little faith. And so we can see that there are great faith and there is little faith. You know, I've not found it in between. I haven't found it in between, Brother Stephen. I haven't ever found where Jesus said, hey, that's some good faith. I've only found it little, and I've found it great. But it can be measured. Now, I want you to know that, first off, it's measured by Christ. Who's the one saying the faith is big or small? Jesus Christ himself. Christ holds the measure and tape. Christ is the one doing the measuring. Now that goes against our way of thinking because we've been praising Jesus, uh, Simon Peter for getting out of the boat for over 2,000 years and Jesus said that was little faith. I mean, you, we preachers have been bragging on Simon Peter ever since he done it. Well, at least he got out of the boat. He's the only one to ever walk on water outside of Christ. That's some, that's some big faith. Not according to Christ. Christ said it's little. He measured it. Now, I wonder if Jesus Christ were to come in here this morning with a tape measure and hold it up to you. I wonder if he'd say your faith is great or your faith is little. Hmm. I want faith that's great. I want faith like that. I want great faith. Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 6. I know you know this verse, but it says, But without faith it is what? Impossible to please him. Now, impossible is a very strong word, but it's the right word. That's a strong word, but it's the right word. And you know what that means, Brother Bo? That means that faith is the exclusive means to satisfying God. It's not just like the, the premium way to please the Lord. It's not just the Baptist way of pleasing the Lord. It's not the hero faith, uh, hero way of pleasing the Lord. It's the only way to please the Lord. 
There is no other means to satisfy God than by faith. So any alternative to faith is a bad idea. Any alternative to faith is a bad idea to God. It may seem more logical to you, and it may seem more logical to man, and it may seem more logical to the banker, but to God, it's a bad idea. Faith can be measured, mismeasured by Christ. Now, we often measure one another's faith. We measure each other's faith. The Baptists have been measuring the faith of of James and John and the rest of the 11 disciples for not getting out of the boat for 2,000 years. We've been measuring their faith. But Jesus looked at Simon Peter and he says, Oh, thou of little faith. How many of you grew up with a a place in the house where you drew a pencil mark over your head and and, and you got a measure tape to see how tall you were? And then you, you go back and check it. I wonder if Jesus Christ does that at church. When we come down the altar, he's... What about that? Your faith ain't got no bigger than it did last year. What about that? Well, you're you're standing up here by the the altar, and I'm, I'm looking at you, and I'm measuring you, and your faith, and you ain't grown none. Or maybe you've come and, and, and you're trusting God with something and he's, he's unclicking the button and he's saying, man, look how that faith is grown. That's some great faith. How many of you got excited when you, when you marked up to that little wall in the house and you checked it and then you turn around and it was this much bigger than the last time? You got excited. You're like, yeah, man, I'm growing. I'm getting taller. How many of you used to cheat? You used to cheat. If you grew up with siblings, you had to cheat because you could not be outgrown, especially if you had sisters. Both of my sisters wound up being taller than me. That stinks. It's embarrassing. Are you growing? Are you growing? Because Christ is measuring our faith. Now, we don't even know that woman's name. Brother Doug, we don't even know the woman's name, and we for sure don't know the daughter's name that was vexed with the devil. And let me just park right there for a quick second and say that this daughter was vexed with the devil. That was the devil's mode of operation. And it still is. Still is. Still is. He's still trying to mess with children. It ain't just in the movies. It's a real deal. It ain't just something Hollywood came up with. It happens. It happens. But Christ is measuring our faith. I wonder, I don't wonder where we're at. He holds the measuring tape. Christ measured Simon Peter. He, he, he measured, oh, what I'll say, we don't even know that woman's name. But most of the world knows Simon Peter's name. He said, your face little. See, it doesn't matter if someone knows your name or not. Christ is measuring our faith. It's measured by Christ. Let me say this, it's measured by circumstances. It's also measured by circumstances. Now in Matthew chapter 8, the centurion comes to Christ because he has a servant, one servant, that is, that, that is grievously vexed with the devil. He's tormented, he said. And he asked Christ to heal him. One person. All right, in Matthew chapter 8, later on, there's 13 men in a boat, at least. One of which is the Messiah, supposed to be the next king of all kings. And the ship's full of water, and it's going down, and he's passed out. That looks real bad. I'm talking about you have fully vested yourself into this man and you're thinking he's going to be the next king and everything you've hoped and dreamed is, is, is wrapped up in him and we're about to sink and die. It's a bad, that's a bad circumstance. Simon Peter has, is sinking in the middle of the ocean. That's a bad circumstance. This mother comes in Matthew 15 and her daughter is grievously vexed with the devil and she begins to beg him. That's a bad circumstance. But it would almost seem like the disciples' storms is probably a little bit bigger. It would seem a little bit bigger. Thirteen people, one of which is the Son of God, might be about to drown. That's bad. But you know, it doesn't matter how big the circumstance is. Just don't let it get bigger than Jesus. It doesn't matter how big the problem is. Just don't let it get any bigger than Jesus. That's, what, that, that's the kind of faith that this woman had. Her problem was huge, but it wasn't bigger than Jesus. 
It's measured by our circumstances. I don't know how many people, probably 95% of all the saved people got saved for eternity. I mean, they got washed in the blood of the Lamb, and their sins are washed away, and they're saved forever. And they believe that. But they have a hard time trusting God with them bills that come every month. We can trust God with eternity. We can trust God with, with, with heaven and hell, but we can't trust Him with the mortgage payment. We can, trust, we, we, we can trust the Lord with every sin we've ever committed, but we can't trust Him with, with what the doctor said. It's measured by circumstances. So faith, number one, can be measured. I want to say, number two, faith can be missed. Look back at our text in Matthew 15. Faith can be missed. In verse number 22, this woman is crying out, Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And I just want to say this, just because this just came to my mind. I want to say this. She identified him for what and who he is, and then she very clearly told him the problem. She very clearly told him that my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. She told him who it involved. She told him how bad it was, grievously vexed, and she told him what was wrong. Her prayer was very specific. It was very clear. It wasn't vague. It wasn't general. It wasn't, hey, can we come talk? i got to tell you about some stuff going on. She said, Lord, thou son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Look, our prayer life ought to be like that. It ought to be clear and it ought to be specific. We ought to tell them how bad it is. We ought to tell them what's wrong and tell them who we're praying for. All right, but verse number 23, But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him. Now they're begging him. Now they're crying out to him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. I said, "Get, just go on. He's not answering you. Verse number 23, he answered her not a word. He's not, just go on. Just leave. No, they had a habit of this. In chapter 14 and verse number 15, there's a great multitude there. And they said, uh, they came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time has now passed. Send the multitude away. that They may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. Now, they had a, a habit of sending folks away. But you know, I just want to say this. Sometimes faith, faith like that can make you look bad. Can make you look bad. This woman is crying out. She's causing a scene. She won't quit and she won't leave. She hasn't got her answer yet, but she just won't stop and it's making her look bad. You know, faith stories aren't really told until there's a big happy ending. And until there's a happy ending, they're kind of frowned on. Ain't that, that's right, that's right. Whether you say amen or not, that's the truth. You kind of look at them like, that was not a probably, that was kind of crazy. That was probably a little overboard. You probably missed the will of God there. But let me tell you something, faith's not found in getting the big answer. Faith is found in still asking even though you ain't got your answer. That's faith. Faith's not found in a big answer. Faith is found in continuing to ask even when there's not an answer. I remember when I was in high school, my youth pastor, his name was Eric Knight, him and his wife Stacy, they couldn't have children. And they prayed and they prayed and they went to all the doctors and they ate all the diets and they went to all the specialists and it just wasn't happening, was it, brother? They just, they just couldn't have any children. And they'd even go to, the, to, to preachers and they would anoint them and they'd pray over them. I remember one time, you'll remember this, a, 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 an evangelist came through and known for his faith and known for his prayer life and, and he prayed over Brother Eric and Miss Stacy and he even told them, he, I think he took up an offering for them and then said, hey, go home and build a nursery. Go home and build that baby room. But no baby came. They were from Texas, and he eventually moved back to Texas where they were planning on trying to adopt. And if you know anything about that, it's expensive. And they had paid, they had invested a lot of money. And, but then a, a missionary in Thailand needed some help. And Brother Eric and Miss Stacy said, you know what, we're going we're to take our name off that list. We're going to go to Thailand. 
Still no baby. Over 20 years been praying. Still no child. And they move and they go to Thailand. They spend some time there serving God and then they make their way back to Texas and now he's pastoring and still no child until sometime last year. Mm, they got a phone call. And this little girl in South Carolina was having a child and couldn't keep it. And, they went, and now they've got a little daughter named Gabriella. They'll be here like next week, I think, something like that. Boy, and that's a wonderful story. Man, they, they held on. Man, their church threw them a baby. They cleaned out. They took all the stuff out of the sanctuary. And they got a sanctuary probably bigger than ours. And they took everything out and they, they set it all up. There was pink stuff everywhere. And they had just tables and rows and, my, and lines of gifts. And the church just, just loved on them, and now, which is wonderful. And, and, uh, and God finally gave them the child they had so long prayed for. And we love to talk about that, and it looks like such a great story of faith. But you know what means more to me than that God finally gave them that child? It was those 20-something years of being faithful and never quitting on God and never backing out of the ministry and never trying to find a way out and never, never abandoning their faith. They just kept going to God and they, they just held on and they, they just kept asking and they just kept praying and they just kept loving God and God's Word and God's people. Even though what they wanted most never came, they just had faith. That's a great faith story. That's a great faith story. And oftentimes it's overlooked. And here in Matthew chapter 15, we have a great faith story. He tells her no. He ignores her in verse 23. Then he tells her flat out, no, I'm not sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He says, you're not even eligible for an answer. Then she worshipped him. Then he said, it's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Now he's not just ignored her, now he has insulted her. She said, the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. He says, oh, great is thy faith. You know what? I want the kind of faith. I want this kind that keeps me close to Jesus even when I can't get what I want. I want the kind of faith that will keep me close to Jesus even when I don't get what I want. Even when I can't have it my way, Brother Stephen. Even when I don't get my ABCs checked off just how I want them checked. And when I bring my list to God and say, I need this, 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 and this. And this is what I want from you. And when he says, no, 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 no. I want the kind of faith that will stay close to him even when I don't get what I want. That sounds nuts. Don't it? I told you this kind of faith will make you look bad. This kind of faith will make you look bad. I want that kind of faith. It can be missed. And I wonder how many great stories of faith we flat out overlooked because there wasn't a beautiful happy ending. There wasn't a beautiful answer that come and made everything just wonderful. Faith can be missed. But number three, I want to say that faith can be magnifying. Faith can be magnifying. In verse number 26, Jesus said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the what? Dogs. She said, Truth, Lord. Yet the who? Dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. In verse number 25, it says, She came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She worshipped by asking. Her prayer of petition became worship. Now, he said, I, I can't give it to the dogs. And then she said, the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. I'll never forget my first dog. I had a dog when I was a little boy. I was probably four or five years old. He was a black lab named Oscar. He died a very tragic death right in front of me in the road, right outside the driveway. I was out there trying to stop him. And my neighbor's Z71, it, it didn't end well. So Oscar was buried and then replaced with a coon hound named Rose. And it was my job every day when I got off the bus from kindergarten to go feed Rose. I had a tea pitcher, scoop it full, and go back there and feed Rose. One day, Miss Megan, I went out there to feed Rose, and Rose wasn't there. I came back in the house, I said, Mama, where's Rose? And she said, uh, she's not here anymore. 
And I said, where did she go? And he said, she said, you're going to have to talk to your daddy when, you get home, when he gets home from work. So Rose got parvo. Rose, Rose didn't make it. So then we became Jack Russell Terrier people. We got a, we got a, a Jack Russell named Maggie. Oh, Maggie was tiny. She had the most short. She wasn't one of them tall ones. She was the short-legged ones. I mean, her little belly would drag the ground sometimes. She had an attitude like a lion. I remember the neighbor had a Rottweiler, and it got in the yard, and, and uh, we heard something screaming, a dog barking like it was dying around outside, and it was that Rottweiler. And Maggie was just on its throat, just flopping in the wind as that Rottweiler ran away. Well, Maggie didn't make it eventually, and she died of old age, and then we got, a, we got another Jack Russell named CJ. Love that dog. And then we had a boxer named Casey, and okay, she was a wild thing. We, she didn't stay long. She was too crazy. Then we landed back on the labs, and then we had labs for the rest of time, rest of our family's time together. We had chocolate labs, had a big one named Rowdy, had a giant big old lab named Woody. You remember that time he jumped out of my dad's truck he had borrowed, and it scratched all the side of that big old red Ford? Well, dog, but he lived. He didn't die. We had dogs. Then one time, Daddy was down preaching in Louisiana where they hunt ducks for a living, and some old guy that worked on an oil rig had a dog he had spent $5,000 training but had to work so much he couldn't keep her, so he gave this dog that had a $5,000 education to my daddy for free. Now, some of you don't have an education that costs $5,000. We've had little bitty dogs, we've had big dogs, we've had dumb dogs, and we've had smart dogs. You know what they all had in common? Old Roy. They were all fed the same thing. Old Roy, because that's the cheapest dog food at Walmart. They we're all fed the same thing. I know some of you dog people are mad at me right now for abusing our animals, but they were happy. They loved their Old Roy. We bought cheap dog food. I just on a whim decided to Google expensive dog food the other day. There's a dog food that costs $207. For a bag of dog food. And I thought, that must be a crate, like a whole pallet full. It's eight pounds. Eight pounds of dogs, $207. That's like $26 a pound. Something like that. I'm not good at math. That's some expensive dog food. And people buy it like crazy. It was like the highest reviewed. And all these people buying this, this high-end dog food, this, this super expensive dog food. That their kids probably don't eat that good. They eat at McDonald's and Burger King and Taco Bell, which is probably worse for them. And they just get you a spoon and go out there with a the dog and eat with them. $207. You think about it. A quarter pounder is $8. But a pound of that dog food's $26. Tell me who's getting better, who's getting treated better. That's some expensive dog food. And people will pay out the, out the wazoo to feed their dog no, you know, grain-free and completely organic and no, no steroids, no hormones, no, no, no junk. Man, they'll pay all kind of stuff. Some expensive dog food. When I read this passage of Scripture, she said, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master. I think, boy, that's some expensive dog food. That's some expensive dog food. You know what she said? She said, just a crumb of what you are. I mean, just a piece, just a little bit, just a crumb of you can conquer these demons. That's what's wrong She's grievously vexed with the devil and she said, but you're so wonderful and you're so much God and you are so powerful and you are so almighty. You are so God that just a little crumb of you can conquer the greatest problem in my entire life. This kind of faith magnifies God and it says God is bigger than any circumstance, than any problem, than any devil, than any demon, than any darkness, than any fear. This kind of faith magnifies God above everything there is. She said just a crumb. It's kind of like if I could just touch the hem of his garment 
If I, if I may but touch his clothes, even the, this kind of face says the smallest part of God is bigger than the worst thing in my life. I want that kind of faith. I want that kind of faith. And it sounds beautiful and it's fun to preach, but it's hard to hold on to. Oh, it's hard to say. It's easy to say. It's harder to stay. I wonder how hard it was for this woman to stay there. I mean, she knows what her problem is. Grievously vexed with the devil. And now she has eliminated all of the solutions and she knows that's the only person that can help me. Just like that woman who touched the hem of his garment. She had spent all she had but rather grew worse. And she had found the one solution that, she, that would help her. So she stayed. Oh, it's, it's easy to say this kind of faith, but it's hard to live. It's harder to live. But that's the kind of faith I want. That's the kind of faith I want you to have. I want you to have that kind of faith when you've lost and lost and lost and lost and lost and lost. Brother William, I hope this is all right, but Brother William and Miss Jennifer, what year did y'all bury that baby? 2001. That's one of the hardest things that anybody on earth will ever do. Bury their child. 2001. You know what? I'm glad William and Jennifer Collins have that kind of faith. To hold on. And to stay with God even when things didn't go good. Or they went the absolute worst way. Miss Tammy got cancer twice. I'm glad she didn't quit. I'm glad she held on. I'm glad she held on. That's the kind of faith I want. That's the kind of faith I want you to have. That's the kind of faith that I want you to pick up on. Trust God even when it looks crazy. Trust God even when it looks crazy. That's the kind of faith I want. What kind of faith do you have? I remember Jesus Christ holds the measuring tape. When he holds it up to you, is it little or is it great? Is it little or is it great? Miss Leslie, can you come? What kind of faith do you have? How big is it? How big is it? You see, she had a bad problem, but her faith didn't just magnify her problem, it magnified Jesus Christ. A lot of times our faith only magnifies one thing, the problem. Because of we, we believe the problem more than we do Jesus. We think its power is more real than we do the Son of God's power is real. That's, what, that, that's why Simon was sinking. That's why the disciples thought they were all perishing. They believed the storm more than they did Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I know it's easy to fuss at them for that, but that's exactly what we do. That's exactly what we do. What kind of faith do you have? Let's stand to our feet.